Our guest today is one of ESPN's most popular and recognized reporters and hosts who currently covers a variety of sports, including college football, basketball, NFL, NBA, NASCAR. <laughs> He's a co-host of the popular radio show, Marty and McGee on SEC Network and ESPN Radio. He is a New York Times bestselling author of his book, Never Settle, Sports, Family, and the American Soul, a top-notch high school baller, a husband, but most importantly, dad to Cameron, Mia, and Vivian, the wonderful Marty Smith. Thank you. Wow. All right. I like it. I like it. You're my hype awesome. man. You come yeah, I'm so, hiring I'm, you full-time. Anything yeah, I do, you're going to be there. I love it. I'm so excited that you're here, Marty. And remember to watch the video version of our podcast and see Marty's smiling face. Please visit NeverLoseYourCape.com. Marty, thank you for being here. I'm so excited. Pleasure's all mine. Uh, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity, and I love what you're doing with this. I think we're in a time when people want hope and when people want positive energy to grasp and we all need that in this super uncertain, weird kind of 18 months that we've been navigating. And in my estimation, we needed that energy well before that. So I love what you're doing. It matters. It's important. And it's inspiring a lot of people. Thank you so much for saying that. We love, since you are a former baller, we love to start every episode with our warm-up segment. So I'm going to ask you two rapid fire questions. What are you binge watching right now? I am. Well, I just finished binge watching the Formula One Drive to Survive series on Netflix. It is absolutely fantastic. And even if you're not an F1 fan, you must watch it because it's really a soap opera. I mean, it really dives into all of the political scenarios that go on in that garage, how teammates are actually the most bitter of rivals and how all of that unfolds. They really get into character development and dive into the lives of the drivers and the team principals. It's really well done. Oh, that's exciting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on my list. Um, second question. I love this one because I love the answers I get. What was the best thing for you about quarantine 2020? The fact that I didn't get on airplanes, I wasn't running to the next plane every single day. You just so graciously kind of rattled off all of my different avenues at ESPN. And with that requires a lot of time. And it's a lot of time in airports. It's a lot of time in hotels. And it took a global pandemic to make me stop. And I will tell you a great story that really encapsulates the impact of that. It was last April, April of 2020. We'd been shut down for about a month. And at that time, we all thought, well, this thing's going to end pretty soon. Like Maybe we'll be done by June, maybe, maybe July, maybe. But I was sitting in my driveway in April of 2020, right outside my office window here with my two daughters, Mia and Vivian, who Mia will be 12 next week. Vivian will be nine uh, in late May. And at the time, uh, I am so used to when the seasons change in the South, I live at Lake Norman, north of Charlotte, North Carolina, and the birds start to chirp in the trees. And it's this beautiful chorus of rebirth. And I love that sound. And I was sitting in the driveway doing sidewalk chalk with my girls, just drawing silly pictures. And those birds started chirping. And that sound is also simultaneous. I also have the blessing of covering the masters for ESPN, part of the, the team there. And that is simultaneous to me with being at Augusta National, that sound, those birds. And my mind went there because when I heard that, I was supposed to that week have covered the college basketball national championship and then the masters. And professionally, that's an amazing thing. Well, I hear that, and I kind of got this odd emo kind of emotion of a bit of tinge of depression. Like, man, that's where I'm supposed to be. But in that same exact moment, I heard my daughters laughing together. And I thought, you egotistical punk, don't, don't forsake the blessing that is right now where your feet are. 
We are healthy. We are happy. We have the opportunity to be together as a family in a way that we never would have had I been, had we not had the pandemic. And as such a, a tragic thing that took claim so many lives and changed our, all of our lives in so many ways, Lainey, my wife and I tried very hard to, to make sure that we were present and look at it in, in that way for us in our own context. Like, okay, we have, we get to be together. And I never would have had that opportunity were it not for something that shut the world down that way. I love that so much. I'm going to repeat that just so everyone really gets it. Do not forsake the blessing that is right at your feet. I love that so much. And you said it so well. This podcast is all about perseverance and hope. And I want to read our listeners something right now that I just, I found and I love so much. This is about Marty's book, Never Settle. You know Marty, right? The guy during college game day hanging off the back of a pickup truck while zooming around the Clemson athletic facilities. The guy who visits Nick Saban's lake house and somehow gets coached to jump into the lake. The guy who sits down with Dale Jr. at Daytona to talk through tears about his miraculous return to racing. The guy who interviews Tiger Woods, Tim Tebow, Peyton Manning, Jimmy Johnson. The guy who gets paid to live the fantasy of every sports fan in America. Marty truly offers unique words of wisdom, which left his readers in awe of his range. He can make you laugh, he can make you cry, and he can inspire you all in the same breath. That is the amazing Marty Smith that we're talking to right now, folks. And I wanna talk to you, never settle. We're all about perseverance and hope here. Tell me about the mentality that came with and came to for, for your book, Never Settle. That was it. Uh, I have been so blessed, and that's the right word. In, in, in today's world, a lot of people use that word and whatnot, but it's really the only one that applies for me because I don't believe in luck. Anybody who is successful and says, man, I've been lucky, I don't believe in that. I think that in a lot of cases, I think kindness, effort, and passion, you make your own luck. And I've been so grateful that so many people have believed in me that I've gotten these opportunities to, with the people that you just mentioned to spend more than a few minutes with them, and in many cases, substantial time with them and they've been gracious enough to open up and be vulnerable with me and answer questions that are open-ended about their lives and their paths that inspire the hell out of me and and I'm just so grateful for that and and as I kind of made my way through the post NASCAR part of my life at ESPN and all these new opportunities started to arise, I thought, man, I, when, when you get Tiger Woods discussing the impact of his father's love and the <laughs> kind of the universal truth for young men that is, I want my father's favor more than anything on the planet. My dad died in 2008, and I'm still trying to make him proud. And you connect on that level, not only with him, but with Coach Saban, with Dale Jr., all these folks. Or, or it's Elena Deladon, the tremendous WNBA player whose sister Lizzie uh, was, was born with myriad obstacles, cerebral palsy, autism, blind, all these different things that she manages. And, and the gravitational pull that that is for Elena that, that makes her feel whole. All of these things that I've gotten to do for ESPN, I thought this is, a, this is bigger than just, than just that platform. And so I wrote Never Settle and I, I made the decision that I was not only going to include those types of stories, but also my own issues. I'm a flawed man. I've made mistakes I want back. But ultimately, back to the definition, I don't want my definition to be ESPN guy or whatnot. I want my definition to be, man, that guy was a good husband and he was a good dad. 
And that's really hard when you're a driven professional. That is not easy. I don't want to be defined by that. So I say all of that to kind of give the groundwork for what Never Settle was. And I made the decision that I was going to be really vulnerable in those truths. And that's a terrifying prospect because anything worth its salt is vulnerable. And if you're willing to put that energy out into the universe, you got to be okay with whatever comes back to you, no matter what it is, because it's genuine. And that is scary as hell. Oh, yeah. And ultimately, um, I have been floored with the energy that's come back to me. It has been overwhelming, quite frankly. Um, I have, I don't know how people get my address. It, that's a little scary sometimes too, but the letters that have arrived at my house, the letters that have arrived at ESPN's headquarters that, that come to me are mind blowing. It is, I needed something to I needed something to hold in my life. I needed hope. I needed perspective. I needed an avenue and a vehicle to carry my emotions. And to, in multiple cases, I, you save my life have been, has been written to me. And that's a very humbling thing. And I, I know that emotion because my, you know, my, my buddy, Eric Church, who's a country singer who wrote the forward to Never Settle, he did that for me through his music. When my dad died, man, I lost a compass in my life. I, I had lost my mom 10 years before that. And I was a lost, lost person. And here I am, uh, barely 30 years old, and my parents are gone. And you're charged with everything that comes in the aftermath of that. You're managing uh, so much on top of the emotion. And I enveloped all that into Never Settle too. And it's just been overwhelming for me. And we made the decision. Lisa, do you know Patrick Abrahams? He's a field producer at ESPN. So Patrick's like my brother and he and his brothers have a charity called tomorrow's team. And with that, they do amazing work for underprivileged youth. And we made the decision in the fall of 2019, as the book was doing very well at retail, that we were going to try to make a difference on an even broader plane. And so we started to go speak to fraternity groups, business schools, with every single game that I was covering um, for ESPN that fall in the college football world, we did speeches on Thursday nights. Any fraternity that would take us, no matter the number. And we didn't want to get paid for that, just buy books. And we have taken all of that revenue and we gave one young man a full scholarship to college, four years to UCF. And another young man we paid for his first year and we'll rekindle that this fall as we continue to progress forward. And it's just something that's so much bigger than us. And all of this is, and I'm just really grateful for it all. I think it's amazing. And, and you say a couple of things here. How did you, cause we have a lot of listeners um, and I have a lot of friends who have lost both parents at very young ages awful i mean that that tends to take you to a pretty dark place what yep. how did you what tools did you use to to one sit in that place and survive but to two pull you out of it mine are not the most mine are certainly not the healthiest um the first thing that that i had was my wife's grace and that's that's a thread throughout the entire book that we can discuss in a minute. Uh, my wife is an amazing human being who has put up with many iterations of whatever I am. The young and naive and uber self-centered version of me when we first got married through what I believe right now to be the best version of myself. She had such great perspective and patience and really helped me learn. Um, so there was that part of it, but outside of that, it was really Jack Daniels and Eric Church's music. Um, so when my dad, so, so this is kind of an extended version, so forgive me, but when my mom, so my mom died of breast cancer two weeks after I graduated from college. And 
I was really young and naive and, and I say this all the time and it kind of drives Lainey crazy because she disagrees with me. My, one of my greatest regrets in this life, if not my greatest, was that when mom was sick, I didn't just drive over the mountain and go see her more from college. I was really selfish and I was chasing what I wanted my career to be. I wanted to party with my buddies and Laney. We went to college together. That's where we met. And so I would, you know, I, my, my parents would be like, no, stay there, have fun. Mm -hmm. And Laney will tell you they meant that. That's exactly what they meant. They said what they meant. But for me, and, and I let them, like, I feel like I let them tell me that. And so because they did, I did that more than I should have. But now being older and with more perspective, I should have gone over there and seen her. And I wish I had for myself now. And so I really regret that. But when my mom died on May 24th of 98, I lost my dad too. Now we still had him physically for 10 more years, but he died spiritually and emotionally and went, he got very depressed reclusive lived off crown royal and ho-hos and marlboro lights and it got to a place where he was so down that a few years later you know my career was starting to progress a little bit as a writer that's where i started it's still my greatest passion and i would call to tell him dad i'm getting to do this today or i'm getting to do that today and you know i wanted that i wanted my excitement to be his excitement and I just wasn't getting that. And so I got to a place where I was like, daddy, I need, look, I, I want nothing more than to talk to you, but if we're going to have a conversation, I want you to call me. I want you to call me when you're ready to chat because I, I don't care if it's 2 a.m. I'll get up and talk to you all night, but I can't call home and have my energy stolen. So that was tough. And then when he died in 08, our house that I grew up in was, I mean, basically condemnable, to be honest with you. I mean, it was, he didn't care. He had really given up. It was all grown up on the outside and on the inside. There, I mean, there was Marlboro tar on the windows and it was just a mess, man. But I really wanted to make that house a home again. And so I'd go up there and, and Laney and I took shifts because it was in such bad shape that we couldn't take Cameron, who was three years old at the time, not even three. He was two and a half at the time. And so we take turns and I'd go up there and I would, you know, my mission today might be to clean the, the, the floor. And, you know, I would drink Jack Daniels out of the bottle. I mean, straight out of the bottle. And I would turn up Eric Church's record centers like me to 11 and I'd sing at the top of my lungs and both of those two things combined were the vehicle that I needed to carry my emotion in the moment. And I ain't proud of it, but it's the truth. And ultimately though, God's good. And that story is why Eric's my best friend now. And right. uh, it's just funny how everything comes together that way. And, and, and those stories have been, extremely therapeutic for other people who that might be their story. That might be something they've experienced that kind of guttural hurt, but they don't either a, they don't know how to, how to say it or B they're embarrassed to mm -hmm. because I mean, sitting there admitting that you're pounding whiskey out of the bottle, ain't the proudest thing of my life, but that's just the facts, man. Um, no, I think, and I, I think, it's really hard to talk about. And I think people carry a lot of shame with it, mm -hmm. which I, I think talking about it takes away that power when, you know, obviously we know 2021 Marty. So we know that, that that path, thankfully for you of binging alcohol did not continue. What snapped you out of that? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, now I, I will say like, it's not like I came home to Charlotte and was doing that. Mm -hmm. That was really just kind of an up there thing in order to 
wrap my hands around all the emotions I was feeling because it was a mixture. It was unbelievable sorrow. It was anger, uh, you know, hurt and, uh, and a lot of amazing nostalgic memories. That's the house I grew up in since I was four. So there was a lot going on up there. And, and so I don't know, I don't know what, what got me out of it, but you know, Lainey of course helped too. She would go up there by herself as well. And she would clean and she would do, We just did so much work to that place. And now it's beautiful. We still yeah. have it now. So you got, you guys as a family still go up there and visit? Well, we now rent it to oh, my nice. sister's best friend growing up, which nice. is amazing who wanted to be closer to her dad again. And so uh, that's really cool for us too. That's great. And it's a great way to keep that nostalgia from your childhood within your Absolutely. family. You also said that, you know, in the book that you, you talk about mistakes that you made that you want back, but you can't get back. What was the hardest? And, you know, I'm trying to write a book too, which will also be called Never Lose Your Cape, like the podcast. And I think you and I have talked about this that being vulnerable and putting yourself out there is really scary, right? It's oh, yeah, really it's scary. Man. What was the most difficult thing for you to share in the book that you were worried about sharing? Yeah, I mean, I guess it was that thing about my mom. Um, the, the, I just remember how I felt. And um, I remember that like I want, I was okay with them telling me don't come home. And I shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have taken that approach. I should have been like, no, I'm coming home and I'm going to spend time with y'all and we're going to fellowship together and we're going to have dinner. And then I ha will have time for whatever else. But because I felt like I was busy and and in a, in, I think in a lot of contexts, I was. I mean, compared to maybe what some other college students were doing in that time, I was taking a bunch of hours of class. I was the stringer for the Washington Post covering Virginia Tech football. Um, I covered preps for the Roanoke Times newspaper. I was working in the sports information office. So, you know, in in – in my mind, I was really busy, really busy, man. I'm busy. And so I, I kind of let them tell me that because as parents, you want what's best for your child and they didn't want to inconvenience me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just still struggle with that part of it, man. And I tell people now, I tell everybody now who I don't care what age they are. If you're dealing with something like that, call up your parents, call them, I, talk to I them. I think that that's so, it's, it's such a, it's something that you can never over talk about, right? So my son, my oldest son now is seven. And if, if he's laying with me on the couch or, you know, whatever, it's quiet. I'll say to him, like, you're always going to lay with mommy on the couch. Right. Or I'll say to him, like, you're always going to call mommy when you grow up. Right. Every day, shoot mommy yeah. a text once uh, because I think that it's really hard to see how important things are when you're 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and then something happens. You turn 30 or you have your own child and you're like, I had no idea then what was really important. I have, I have regret about, you know, my grandfather got sick and died very suddenly. Um, and I, it, and I have regret of like, what was I doing that I couldn't go visit more? Or what was I doing that I couldn't call them more? And I think at the time, it's exactly what you're saying. It's that I'm busy and you don't realize how important it is. You know, my grandfather was such a, he was the greatest man I've ever known. And, and the fact that I didn't get more phone calls with him and didn't get more visits with him is, is very sad to me. And I think that it's so hard to show people how important it is when they don't have perspective on it yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I always say life is per perspective and repetition. 
And I didn't have that perspective for sure. And again, you know, back to, to being a husband, like I'm a, like, I, I know now I'm a very attentive one. I know now that it is her first. I know now all of those things that a very young man might not know. And I didn't, and she had patience and she showed me, she showed me the right way to do it. And I was fortunate that I had a mother. My mom was the most amazing, most gracious person I've ever known. And she taught me how to be respectful. It was never about respect. It was about like, well, right now I want to go do this and I'm going to go do this. Like, it's just the way, I mean, I, I didn't know. I, I just, there were things that I just wasn't ready for or whatever. And fortunately, um, now uh, we're 21 years into this thing and it's, uh, I mean, it's never been better. I mean, when I don't even were, know what, I don't know what else to say. It's just never been better. She's amazing. No, I, I think it comes with maturity too. And I think, you know, uh, like you, I met my husband in college and we've been together 19 years and it, it is when they say it's a marathon, it's a marathon, it's a marathon. And then you put pandemic in it and nobody, nobody said 24 seven every single day. Well, right. You, you, in order for it to work, you both have to be pliable malleable you have to be willing to adjust and evolve together and communication is everything mm -hmm. and all, i mean it again we we have grown up together when i got married i was barely 24 she was barely 23 and that is insanely young to make a forever commitment it's insanely young and we are both so grateful that we were willing, like if, if she had an issue with the way I was operating in a certain way, communication is so important. She says it to me. I digest that and internalize that and decide, yeah, okay, you're right. I'm going to do that. And it's just been uh, such a unique process. And again, back to her selflessness, like think about, how selfless you have to be to be married to this career. Mm -hmm. In my role, I don't go host a show for an hour a day, which is, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you go and you do your production meetings and all of those things. And you make, you make sure you're aware of everything going on. And then you come home at the end of the show. Like that's not our life. Our life is, Hey, Marty, Tiger Woods wrecked a car get on the next plane. And that's been our life since we met. Mm -hmm. And, but, but I, I look, I, you have her, she, you have to be so selfless to do that. And she really is. And, and I am so grateful for that because the fact of the matter is you don't have this career without a, a spouse who is that way. It just doesn't work. Because think about how often she has to be a single parent. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do the master's for eight days, that's eight days where she's by herself. With three and kids. Reminder, Marty three has kids. three children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a, she's amazing person. I don't, I, I marvel at it. When, now, what's interesting about you is that you clearly have this very extans expansive career at ESPN but people, I, I don't want people to think you went, it was easy. Hey, right? I know you, it wasn't you, easy. Yeah. So tell us about like one of the hardest times in your career at ESPN. Um, well, there's been several, I think this is probably the eighth iteration or so of me at the company, because I mean, when I started at the end of 2006, I can't believe it's been that long, but when I started there at the end of 06, I was what's called a NASCAR insider. I might've gotten two and a half minutes of TV a week, mm -hmm. maybe. And from there, uh, I covered NASCAR at ESPN for eight years exclusively. All I covered was auto racing. And at the end of 2014, um, 
we lost the broadcast rights. NBC bought NASCAR's broadcast rights. And so we weren't in the auto racing business anymore. And I didn't know what I was going to be, but I had been at NASCAR. I had been covering NASCAR since the day I graduated from college and I made the decision. Okay. 15, 16, 17 years is enough. I want to go see what's out there. I don't care if ESPN sends me to the chainsaw races or the cornhole championship. I just want to see what else I can do. And I had, that was, so the season ended November, in November of 14. And back to Laney being a single mom, I come home from the last race of the 2014 NASCAR season. And I had been gone for 20 weeks. I mean, basically a hundred or so of 130 or 40 days, she'd been solo with eight, five, and two at home. Yeah. I mean, any parent that hears that goes, how in the world? And I don't know how, I don't, I don't, I don't think she knows. If I called her in here right now, she'd probably be like, I, I took every, every hour at a time. Prayer. <laughs> Prayer. And, and so I come home and, and she was really smoked, man. She was just cooked as you could imagine and really needed me home. And I told her at the time, don't worry. Like my new contract with ESPN doesn't start until January 1st. This was mid-November. I'm going to be home at least for six weeks with nothing to do. God had other plans. I sit down on the couch that, I mean, maybe 15, 20 minutes after saying that and open up my email and I have an email from Lee Fitting. The very first email in my, in my box was from the guy who at the time was the executive producer of College Game Day. He now oversees all of football at ESPN, Monday Night Football, all of our live – I mean, he is the guy. And it said, Marty, your passion belongs in college football. Really love how passionate you are in the way you report. Start studying because I'm going to embed you with one of the four teams that qualify for the inaugural college football playoff. Lisa, you work at our company for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know that that doesn't happen. You don't take, you don't take a sports centric reporter, especially a niche sport and go, we're going to put you on our biggest, biggest property. Doesn't happen. Not you only never, does it not happen, happen, it never happens that somebody comes to you and says, we're going to lift you up. It's unbelievable. Very rarely happens. It's unbelievable. And that's part because Lee saw something in me. John Wildhack, our former boss, saw something in me. Yeah, he's the man. He's now Syracuse's AD, for those of you listening who may not know about John. And he's a great man. And ultimately, uh, off. I, I mean, I, I called Laney, and we dispute this part of the story. I think <laughs> she answered the phone, where are they sending you? Because I called her immediately. And uh, she doesn't agree with that. She doesn't remember me saying that. But the long and the short of it is, I said to her at the time, I said, uh, I've been given this opportunity. This is an, uh, an opportunity that I can't articulate to you how rare it is. And if you will just trust me, it's going to change our lives. And she knows, and I knew at the time, like she had no say in it. Mm -hmm. Like I was going to do this because that email was a treasure map. If I was willing to follow its direction and I was willing to dig deep enough, it was going to offer us riches beyond our wildest dreams. And Lisa, I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about life experience. And Lainey sucked it up somehow. She didn't like it and I don't blame her. But off I went and I jumped in the college football world with the Ohio State Buckeyes who went on to win the national championship that year with Urban Meyer as their head coach and Ezekiel Elliott in the backfield and Michael Thomas at wide receiver and Joey Bosa at defensive end and Darren Lee and Raquan McMillan at linebacker and they just had do NFL dudes everywhere and it was a fairy tale and from there uh, my blessings have just continued so um any, and that's, again, uh, back to where I started with that whole crazy tangent is Lainey is so selfless, but she also understands the amazing life that it affords us. 
us, not me, us. And I am infinitely grateful for that. I tell her that all the time. What would she say, if we asked Lainey, what would she say is the hardest part about your career? Uh, airplane, yeah, being gone. Mm -hmm. That's it. She loved, now the, another cool thing about her, and I've talked about her on, on shows and podcasts and my book and all that before, but I don't think I've ever said this. Like, I might have said it in my book, I forget. But the, what's wild about it is she doesn't just tolerate it. Like she's genuinely excited because she knows how excited I am for all the opportunity. Like she is genuinely excited to live vicariously through that. And she wants to know every detail I can, like every single detail every day she wants to know about. She's your hype man. Oh, dude, it's really something. Uh, it's really something. I mean, I can I get think, her in here I if you want to ask I think what you're her. speaking to is so important. I think that, you know, for all our young listeners out there, the best thing I could tell you is to marry someone whose dreams are as big as yours and that will support you along the way. Got it. Like, and, and, and man, like we are so, we started as friends. Like, I don't think she, she my wife grew up in South Jersey on the shore, on the beach. She loved Kelly Slater. Marrying a redneck country boy from a farm in Appalachia was not her plan, <laughs> especially a redheaded one. And so we were buddies first. And, <laughs> and I'm so grateful to say, like, not only do like we love each other so much still after, again, May 20th is our 21st anniversary. We really like each other. Like we really like each other too. And that's awesome. Oh, totally awesome. And you, and, and what's great about you is that it's very easy to feed off your energy. And the fact that Lainey reciprocates that, not only is she excited for you, like there are a lot of people out there that, you know, sometimes I'll say like, don't be a fun sponge. Like if I come oh, yeah, at you and I'm super excited, like reciprocate my excitedness, right? That's the best thing you can do for someone. I want to reiterate for our listeners, the things that you have in your toolkit. Number one is to never forsake the blessings that are right at your feet. That's number one. I love it. Number two, you always said that you have been successful because you lead with kindness, effort, and passion. That's and it. I absolutely love that. And I want to ask you the same question that I ask all of our guests here. What would you say is your final message of hope that you want other people to know? It's, it's certainly that it's, it's in a world where we control so little. Now, if you're a person of faith, you believe it's written anyway, right? But we tend, no matter what level our faith is or what we believe, we still think we can strong arm things into happening. And so in a world where we control so little, I mean, the vast percentage are uncontrollables out there in the world. We control three things every single day. We control kindness. We control effort. We control passion. If we are genuinely kind to other people and we give every last ounce of everything we got to whatever it is we want to achieve, and we do it with an undeniable positive energy we cannot lose. And I know that because I am proof of that. I ain't the best looking. I got a Southern accent. I mean, it's all, I got every, everything in broadcasting that can go against somebody. I pretty much, I mean, I, I, that, that's where I am. But I've made a career off of working my tail off and being nice to people. And I, I will never be out passionate. I don't care what it is. And you know, young, young aspiring broadcasters come to me all the time from Southern University saying, my professor said, I got to lose this accent. And all I do is point to you. How did you do it? And I said, uh, again, it goes back to being a grain of sand. I was fortunate enough that I started at ESPN covering NASCAR racing. So there was authenticity there. And then, but, but don't think I didn't take a whole ration of grief when I went to college football, people were like, what is this redneck NASCAR person doing talking about college football? 
But what do you do? You work hard, you stay passionate, you're kind to people and you win them through the work. And I've been blessed to do that no matter the platform. And that's not, that's not going to stop. Like my next formula one is like my next mission. I am a Southern farm boy. We'll see what happens. Um, but it's crazy, Lisa, that those three pillars, they offer hope just by example. They are hope. And, and I love that. And, you know, as we've gone through 2020 and made our way into 2021, I've really started to kind of add respect to that too. Because in so many cases in this life, you get what you give. And, and respect ain't hard. It's just if you, if, you, if you take the time to learn about somebody and you offer them respect, then you're going to get it in return most of the time. And so all of those things are so fundamental, aren't they? They're fundamental. People say, man, how do I get your job? That's, I can't answer that question. It's literally impossible to answer. But I always say those things right there because they've been my formula. Amazing. Thank you so much, Marty, for sharing your stories of perseverance with all of us. If you have any further questions or comments for myself or Marty, please visit our website, neverloseyourcape.com and send us a note in the contact us section. And as a reminder, you can see the video version of this episode at neverloseyourcape.com. The Marty Smith, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Pleasure's mine. And I hope you guys have an amazing day. Thank you for having me. And again, I love what you're doing, girl. It's awesome.